All right, so for this warm-up problem, they're talking about early flash bulbs. I don't know if you've ever seen those movies in the 1920s, but they would take a picture, the bulb would flash bright, and they'd actually have to change the bulbs. This was the chemical reaction that was used to make that flash. They actually burn magnesium with oxygen. It's a brilliant, bright white light. All right, in the first reaction they're showing, you've got 24 grams of magnesium oxide, and you're reacting it with oxygen, or sorry, you've got 24 grams of magnesium and you're reacting it with 16 grams of oxygen to make 40 grams of magnesium oxide. All right, down here though, it's saying reaction two, we've got 6.0 grams of magnesium and magnesium's elemental symbol is Mg. So if we look at this, we're going from 24 grams down to six grams. Looks like we've got one fourth the amount, right? So I just say one fourth the amount, all right, which means that we would need how much oxygen if we're doing that same process? Yeah, four grams, right? So one fourth of 16 would be four grams. And if you do this, how much magnesium oxide would you expect to get out? 10 grams. All right, so in this problem, we can say that there's 10 grams magnesium oxide. The thing that throws people though, is they say, up here though, it says 12 grams of oxygen. What happened to the other oxygen? It wasn't used, right? So if we think about this, another way of thinking about it is we only used four of the 12 grams. So that means that we must have eight grams of leftover oxygen. So this one was a little bit more challenging than the ones we saw in the problem of the day. But again, it shows that the ratios have to stay the same for a chemical reaction. And sometimes if you have excess, it just sits around and is completely unused. Does that make sense? All right, let's jump into the new chapter. I got a lot of videos for this one. <laughs> all right, so chapter three is all about the atom and what makes up an atom. Previously, we talked about atoms being the smallest piece of matter. However, that's kind of true, kind of not true, and I've got a lot of experiments that I wanted to show you. The first one is by J.J. Thompson in 1897, and he did an experiment with something called a cathode ray tube. So let's take a look at the experiment. Okay, this is a cathode ray tube. What it essentially is, it's a vacuum chamber. There are no gases inside this glass tube. Uh, the only thing we have are two electrodes, one's called the cathode, the other's called the anode, and a fluorescent screen um, in the background. It's coated with some type of fluorescent material. When I turn the power supply on, we'll see a beam that, is, that causes that fluorescent screen to glow. Looks like a nice straight line, doesn't it? We call that a cathode ray because it emanates or begins at the cathode and shoots across over to the anode. J.J. Thompson was working with cathode rays. We really didn't understand what they were. I mean, we have electricity going in one side and coming out the other, but there's nothing inside to conduct it. It's a vacuum tube. So he decided to apply a magnetic field um, to this cathode ray and he found something interesting. We apply one pole of the magnet to this beam and we'll see what it does and then we'll flip it around and see what the other pole does. This is my favorite part. Can you see what's happening to that beam? Well, this appears though it's happening to it. It's moving. It's moving, it's being repelled, isn't it, by the magnet. Let me flip the magnet around and what do you think is gonna happen this time? Well, if it's being attracted on one pole, See how it's being attracted there? Let me rotate it so the kids on the, this side of the room can see it. See how it's being attracted there? And then the other pole, you see how it's being pushed down? What does that tell me about that beam? It has a what? It has a charge. 
Let me tell you about the poles of the magnet. The one that pushes it away is the negative pole. So what does that tell you about the charge of those particles? Negative. Negatively charged particles. And J.J. Thompson was actually able uh, to do a charge uh, to mass ratio of these particles. And he found that these particles were about 2,000 times lighter than a hydrogen atom. Now at the time, that was very profound. What did Dalton say? Are there any particles smaller than an atom? J.J. Thompson just found something 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom. Why is the hydrogen atom and something 2,000 times smaller than it so profound? Hydrogen. Because hydrogen is the smallest. Because hydrogen is the smallest atom, isn't it? So if we found something 2,000 times smaller, we have found our first subatomic particle. All right, so I'm going to leave it right there. This was really interesting at the time because physicists were saying that beam is light. Can you deflect light with a magnet? No, not at all. And so he knew that it had to be some sort of particle because you can only deflect particles, right? But he knew that they must have been super duper tiny. I really like this quote of his where it says, if in the very intense electric field in the neighborhood of the cathode, the molecules of gases are dissociated and split up, not into ordinary chemical atoms, but into these primordial atoms. He didn't really know what to call them, so he called them primordial. And he says, which we shall for brevity call corpuscles. Does, whoop, does anybody know what we call these today? We don't call them corpuscles. What do you think? Electrons, Electrons right? So in the video, he showed that the negative pole pushed away the beam. Opposite charges repel, right? And so he knew it must also have a negative charge as well. This is an interesting technology. How many of you have heard the term CRT TVs or CRT computer monitors, right? So CRT is short for cathode ray tube. Those big fat TVs are the big fat computer monitors that were popular in the 90s and um, all the way back to the 40s. Those were cathode ray tubes where they actually deflected electrons to certain portions of the screen to get a visual image. So it's a, a neat technology. What was that doing for a magnet? Yeah, it kind of messes up the whole deflection. So that's why if you have a, a TV, you don't want it to be around a large magnet. It'll um, permanently damage the screen sometimes, depending on the strength of the magnet. Why wouldn't it just repel it for that? There's a lot more going on. Um, this, this is outside of this class, but the coating on those is actually uh, phosphorescent and it, it messes up the electronics inside. Yeah. All right, so he was the first one to describe an electron. And the interesting thing about this is he knew it was small, and he knew it was smaller than hydrogen, which at the time we knew was the smallest atom on the periodic table, so it must have been subatomic. Which again, like I said, um, the Dalton theory said that you can't split atoms into smaller pieces. But what they started finding around the early 1900s was that atoms are made up of these smaller particles, one of which was electrons. Does that make sense? All right. The interesting thing was he had this idea about atoms. And I'll show you his idea. His idea was that there must be be a counter charge to those electrons that must be positive and he thought this positive charge took up a lot of space and that you just had these electrons kind of randomly distributed throughout the positive charge. He referred to this as the plum pudding model because he was English and they like plum pudding. If you haven't had plum pudding, it's like a bready type thing with raisins and stuff in there. And he thought of the electrons like the raisins and plum pudding. What they found out, though, was, yeah, this wasn't quite the full story. And the experiment that was done to refute this basically said, if we 
hit this with other particles, those particles should go straight through it, right? A good way of thinking about this is electrons are so itty bitty, there will be nothing to really deflect those particles. Or if they are deflected, they won't be deflected very much, right? The next experiment that was done was by Ernest Rutherford. And what he did was he pounded out a piece of gold into the thickness of only a few hundred atoms. Gold is really unique that way. You can keep on pounding it and make it into a gold leaf that is super duper thin. And then what he had over here is something called an alpha source. And that's produced by decaying radium. He really didn't understand what the heck was going on. He just knew it was emitting something that was particle-like. Um, the reality is what was occurring here is alpha particles are helium atoms without electrons. And what he found was that when you slam these helium atoms without electrons into the gold sheet, some of them were actually deflected completely backwards, which didn't make sense, right? If you had these little itty bitty electrons, they shouldn't deflect a heavy atom backwards, right? Like if you think about playing pool or something like that, you'd have to have a heavy object to hit for it to bounce completely backwards. And this was interesting. And so what he thought was that in order to account for this, you must have some sort of massive thing inside the center of all of your nuclei. But it doesn't take up very much space in the atom. So most of the particles went straight through. They missed those heavy pieces. But there must be a heavy piece because some of the alpha particles were deflected backwards. There's kind of a neat video here. We'll just watch this super quick that explains that concept. In 1910, in Rutherford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were scattered as they passed through a thin gold foil. Most of the alpha particles passed through undeflected. However, a few were found to be scattered at large angles, some even back in the direction from which they had come. This meant that they had collided with an object much more massive than the alpha particles themselves, yet so small that only a few alpha particles encountered them. This atomic level view shows what is happening. Most of the atom is occupied by the low mass electrons. The nucleus is small and massive. When an alpha particle encounters a nucleus, it is scattered at a large angle. So it's pretty interesting. So he basically went back to J.J. Thompson and he said, I think you're wrong. Instead of this plum pudding model, there has to be something massive in there. And in order to have a balanced charge, this massive thing in the center must have a positive charge. So he determined a few things. It must be positive. It must be relatively heavy. And it doesn't occupy very much of the atom. So it doesn't take up much space. And at the time, this was pretty revolutionary. One of my friends used to call this cowboy chemistry because they were working with a lot of radioactive isotopes. They had no idea how harmful radiation was, and a lot of these early scientists and their lab techs ended up dying of cancer at very young ages. So this was Ernest Rutherford's contribution to science. And this model holds up really well. This is called the nuclear model. And he ended up calling the central portion, that massive chunk, the nucleus. Kind of like with the cell. In the cell, you've got that central organelle called the nucleus. Yep? I was just wondering how he was able to detect where the alpha particles of the letter they went through That's a great question. So if you look at this big ring around there, it was coated in a phosphorescent coating, which meant every time a particle is deflected, it would actually light up a little bit. So phosphorescent material is kind of like the, I'm trying to think of a good example. You know fluorescent light bulbs in your house? Not the incandescent ones, the, the newer, more modern ones. 
quite often if you're in your house, look at them, shut off your light, shut off all the lights, and you'll see them glow for a while. What they do is they remain um, in their excited state and emit light back to you. And that's a similar um, phenomenon that they used here to observe the particles. It's kind of unique. So it was revolutionary, and there was a lot of debate back and forth. But if you can see, this was in the span of less than a decade. They went from not knowing anything about what made up an atom to understanding the core concepts of subatomic particles. Yep. So that new model that you created, if you can't see it, how do you look so accurately, like, theoretically, what it like? Uh, based on his experiment, right? The only way those particles could be deflected backwards would be to have something relatively heavy on the inside of an atom so that when it hits it, it gets deflected backwards, right? So it must be approximately the same mass as a helium atom. And the only way to account for that is something pretty big in there. Yep? Why do you say there's several items or several like, like bricks wrapped up behind the other? Because one brick might not stop the truck, but like 300 Yeah, so in the plum pudding model, they didn't really understand what the positive charge was. They, to be honest at the time, thought it was just an empty void that had an overall positive charge. And they knew that there must be electrons in there due to the cathode ray tube experiment, but those electrons he knew were itty bitty, one one thousandth the mass of a helium or hydrogen atom. So if you hit it with a helium atom that's a thousand times heavier, it's not going to get deflected very much, right? So if you've got a particle that's a thousand times heavier than another particle and it runs into it, it's just going to obliterate that other particle and not get deflected very much. Where Ernest Rutherford said, wait, some of these particles are getting deflected backwards, so there must be something relatively heavy in there to do that deflecting. It's a little bit strange. Shortly after this, in 1909, Robert Millikan contributed even more to this work. He started studying electrons to a much higher degree, and he ended up finding the exact mass of an electron. The really cool thing with his experiment, I don't have a good video for it, is his measurements were amazingly precise. We use almost the exact same value he came up with today. So he was doing this in 1910 before cars were even invented. Pretty incredible stuff. Um, later on, they discovered that the nucleus is also made up of different particles, and we'll talk about that next. Does anybody know what a nucleus is made of? made up of something that's positively charged. Does anybody remember what that's called? A proton. It's also made up of something called a neutron. They didn't know about neutrons until much later. I believe that was like the 1930s, and that was uh, using some very fancy experiments. If you are interested in watching a fun video, um, I think his name is Hank Green, and he has a YouTube channel called Crash Course, and it's about 10 minutes long. It's really quick, it's really fun, and he, um, I think is uh, an engaging speaker to watch, so he kind of talks about the history and clarifies some of the things we glossed over a little bit. Sound good? I'll put this up on the website as well. All right, so now we got to dig into those subatomic particles a bit more and define them. And we've got three main particles that we've discussed. The first one that was discovered was the electron. The next one that was discovered was the proton. And then the last one was the neutron. And they also knew the charges of each. They knew that electrons must have a charge that is negative, and so they just said it's negative one for every electron. Protons, they knew, had to counteract those electrons, so they were a positive charge. So it's positive one. And then neutrons, on the other hand, they found out have no charge, and that was the later experiment. They also found the mass in AMU. So you remember yesterday we talked about atomic mass units? 
They found the mass of a proton and neutron was approximately 1 AMU. Pretty handy. They found the mass of an electron was much, much, much smaller. Um, that was something that J.J. Thompson also found out. And they found out that it is approximately 1 over 1,837 times smaller. So considerably smaller than the mass of a proton or a neutron. They also, from these experiments, found out their relative location. The electrons, they knew, kind of floated around the outside of the nucleus. While the other two were in this compact area that was defined as the nucleus. And to this day, these are the main subatomic particles that we talk about in chemistry. If you go on into particle physics, you can actually break these into smaller and smaller pieces, but that's jumping down a rabbit hole we're not even going <laughs> to get near. All right. There are some interesting things, though, primarily having to do with neutrons. What they found out was neutrons can actually change a little bit about an atom. So I did want to show you this. And we talked about it yesterday a little bit, too. These are referred to as isotopes. Has anybody watched The Simpsons? The baseball team in Springfield is called the Springfield Isotopes because of the nuclear power plant. Um, it's atoms or elements that differ in the number of elect or number of neutrons that they have. Number of neutrons. All right, so let's take a look at a really simple one. First one is, let's say I've got a proton. I'm just going to abbreviate that with the positive charge. And I've got an electron. And this electron's kind of in this shell floating around that proton. What we do is we say, this is a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atoms always have one proton. And the number of particles in the nucleus is one. So we put the one on top. And then what they found out was there's actually other types as well where maybe you've got a proton and a neutron clustered together in this nucleus as a tight little ball. Still has one electron floating around. It's still hydrogen. We know hydrogens always have one proton. However, now it's got a neutron. So what we would do is put a number two up here indicating that now the nucleus is made up of two subatomic particles. And then last but not least, we can get into these really exotic ones where you've got two neutrons and you've got an electron kind of floating around here. This is hydrogen 3. So hydrogen 1, like I said, has one proton. This one has two particles in the nucleus. The other one has three. This is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So these are isotopes of one another. They differ in the number of neutrons that they have. If we look in nature, this one is present at about 99.9% .9 of the time. Deuterium is about 0.1%. And this one is found in a trace amount. Typically, the more neutrons you cram in, the more unstable it becomes, and they tend to be radioactive and fall apart on their own. Has anybody seen the movie Moon with Sam Rockwell? If you like sci-fi movies, it's a good sci-fi movie. But they actually talk about mining uh, tritium on the moon um, to be used in a fusion reactor. So it's kind of a, a unique element, but it is radioactive and hard to find. 
All right, so these differ in the number of neutrons that they have, but they're all hydrogen atoms, and they have different stability and properties. All right, so let's make some notes. The first one is an element is defined by the number of protons it contains. And the example I said is hydrogen always has one proton. It can vary in the number of neutrons it has, it can vary in the number of electrons it has, but hydrogen by its very nature must always have one proton. Second one is isotopes differ in the number of neutrons. I'm just going to rehash that. have to be very careful with how we write out elemental symbols in order to account for different isotopes of molecules. So I'll show you some examples to get us off the ground and this should help with the pod as well. Quite often you'll see a few numbers. So does anybody remember what C stands for on the periodic table? Carbon. My favorite element, it's an element of organic chemistry. And you can tell a few things. The C means it's a carbon atom. The six is the atomic number. That's also known as the number on the periodic table, right? So if you look at carbon on the periodic table, you see the six there. It just tells you the position that it's at on the periodic table. In addition to this, it also tells us something valuable. We know that carbon must have six protons. So the atomic number is also the number of protons. And then up here, we've got this unique one. This is referred to as the mass number. And this is the number of protons plus neutrons. So how many neutrons must carbon-12 have? Yeah, exactly. Carbon-12 must have six neutrons. and clear. All right, so quite often you'll see it written this way. Sometimes people will omit the atomic number on the bottom because we know, looking at the periodic table, that carbon is always going to be six in that position. That's how it's defined. The mass number, though, tells you the isotope that you're looking at. Does that make sense? All right, let's try a new one. And I'm going to pick a cool element, one of my favorites actually. This is 238 Pu. And if we look at Pu on the periodic table, that's atomic number 94. Does anybody know what Pu stands for? I'll give you a hint. Think of atomic bombs. There's uranium atomic bombs, if you know history, and what's the other type? Plutonium. plutonium. It's actually more common in atomic bombs. Okay, so this is plutonium-238, unique one, and I've got three questions for you. The first one is the number of protons. Number two is the number of neutrons. 
And last but not least, we've got the number of electrons. This one's a little bit trickier. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about this and then check with your neighbor. All right, let's do this now. How many protons are in plutonium-238? 94, right? We know we've got 94 protons because plutonium is atomic number 94. It's defined by its atomic number. All right, how many neutrons? 144, so you do 238 minus 94 means it must have 144 neutrons. Quite often students get hung up and they say, shouldn't the number of protons always equal the number of neutrons? Not always. Like I said, isotopes vary in the number. In fact, when you get into really heavy elements, you tend to have a lot more neutrons than protons. All right, how many electrons must we have? 94, right? We know we need to bounce out our positive and negative charges, right? In the, in the positive, it just says all of our neutrons. Yeah, assume all of them have a bounce of protons and electrons for the problem of the day. We'll get into cations and anions later. We're just not quite there yet. The reason I really like this element is it's fascinating. So when we were trying to develop atomic bombs, we ended up making a bunch of other unique stuff that was never before seen in nature. And this was one of the elements that was made as a byproduct to making atomic fissile materials. This is plutonium-238. All right, and if you look at it, it glows red hot. You don't have to heat it, it just glows red hot on its own. Does anybody know why it's red hot? You think this is very safe to be around? No. Being around plutonium is incredibly dangerous. It is highly radioactive. I'm going to make a note here. Highly radioactive. It gives off a lot of heat. In fact, that was one of the first things they discovered when they were looking at radioactive materials is they were warm and they didn't quite understand why they were warm, but they knew they were warm and they knew people were getting sick when they were working with them. Yep. How are they blocking radioactivity? Is it some like a denser material to stop? That's a good question. So with radioactive materials, you don't want to be around them. It depends on the type of radioactivity. That determines the danger, right? There's alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Gamma is really nasty stuff. Um, alpha is not that bad. Beta can be bad. It really depends on the type of, of radiation and the exposure. The safest thing you can do when you're around radioactive material is have a big lead sheet in front of you. So if you've ever been in a hospital and gotten an x-ray, they typically put a lead apron over you to prevent any radiation from hitting your body. You don't want x-rays damaging your DNA. Lead's yeah, lead's very good at absorbing other materials. Yep. It means it's unstable, exactly. Radioactive materials are unstable and want to form other things. The, yeah. I was just going to ask, where do you find plutonium? So that was my question. It's made artificially. Yeah, we're not going to get into all that stuff. That's way beyond this course. But it's interesting. And in fact, I put the Bikini Atoll um, link on the course website. So if you are interested in learning about it, the history is absolutely fascinating and horrifying at the same time. We tested some incredibly dangerous bombs. The Soviets did as well. Um, we've been trying to reduce the number of atomic bombs. But as a byproduct of that, we're not producing as much plutonium-238. How many of you saw the movie The Martian? It's a pretty good movie. If you haven't seen it, it's really fun to watch. The book, in my opinion, is even better. In this movie, what they did was they went out and they found one of the rovers on Mars, and this rover had plutonium-238 in it. And the whole idea with this is it gives off so much heat, you can actually capture that heat and use it for energy. And use heat energy and convert to electrical energy. So these were called thermoelectric energy 
um, generators, and they were commonly used in NASA and still are used. The neat thing with this is one kilogram produces about 500 watts of electricity. 500 watts is enough to power a few computers, electronic devices, things like that. And it's really powerful because the half-life of this is in the decades, so you can have this in there. It'll continue to produce electricity over the course of decades. How many of you know about the Voyager probes? So the Voyager probes and Cassini probes also had plutonium-238 in there as the energy source. Basically, it was a big, hot battery that was being um, used. Why did we need a big, hot battery in the Voyager probes? Does anybody know? What do you think? Exactly. When you're that far away from the sun, you can have solar panels the size of football fields. You won't get enough uh, solar energy to actually power your electronics. That's one of the main reasons. The other main reason is outer space is cold, right? If electronics get too cold, sometimes they fail and don't work correctly. So this had a dual use of keeping the electronics warm and providing electricity for the spacecraft. Like I said, the one problem that we're facing now with NASA is we're not making atomic bombs, which means we're not making plutonium-238, which means NASA is running out of plutonium-238, and they're trying to figure out what to do to power our next generation space probes. And so there's actually talk of starting up our uh, nuclear reactors again, not with the purpose of making atomic bombs, but with the purpose of making some of these exotic elements. So just a unique tidbit of history. Tomorrow what we'll do is we'll continue on practicing this, but I wanted you guys to get started on that problem of the day first.